Make sure you guys hit the subscribe button if you guys are enjoying the content that we're throwing up. And uh, make sure you guys hit the like button if you enjoy the video. And yeah, let's begin. Okay, so we're getting into uh, Thor. Well, it's technically not called Thor Reborn, but it might as well be. Um, it's basically Odin's son going back to being in the role of Thor, which, I mean, it's cool, but I like Jane Foster as Thor. I mean, I, I, I miss Jane Foster as Thor. She was awesome. I mean, I don't know if we'll ever get a character or get her going back to being Thor again, but she was awesome as Thor, and I, I thought it was great storytelling. But uh, this is Odin's son going back to being the, being the character of himself. Now, what's happened here... <laughs> <laughs> the way this picks up is is this is out in Thailand. Now, this is actually kind of interesting because technically speaking, this should be in Korea. And, and I'll explain why here in a second. But this starts off in Thailand and it actually starts off with Thor having raided the Temple of Sidorak to steal something called the Warlock's Eye. Now, the Warlock's Eye is a very, very old artifact. This goes all the way back to Thor 131. And uh, well, technically speaking, it's, yeah, I guess it's, man, it's weird. Journey into Mystery in Thor. <laughs> anyway, it goes back to Thor th uh, 131 by Stanley and Jack Kirby. The Warlock's Warlock's eye was an artifact that if a person used it, they could basically dominate the minds of others. Now, Marvel has a lot of artifacts like that, right? Like, like different things like that. Doctor Strange can do that. Telepaths can do that. That's one of the things I want you guys to keep in mind for future reference. When it comes to the Infinity Stones, they are unique in their own right, in the sense of like, there are only one set of Infinity Stones, but there's a lot of other objects out there that can do something akin to it or are sometimes equally dangerous. Like the Casket of Ancient Winners, the Crimson Bands, and the Crimson Gem of Sidorak. Depending on how you use them, they can actually be pretty damn dangerous. But Thor's raided the temple for the purpose of capturing the eye. And the reason why is because following the destruction of uh, of Asgardia, basically the rebuilt Asgard that Iron Man had made following the events of Siege, when Mangog had stormed the, the, the gates, really, of Asgardia and started, you know, tearing everything up and basically destroyed the entire area, the weapons of Odin had essentially just, like, flung across the cosmos and traveled across, you know, to different realms, or not really realms, but different places across, really, the main Marvel Universe proper. Now, there is an indication here it has traveled across the realms, but Thor can't see into those, and we'll find out why here in a second but the warlock's eye is one of these objects now the warlock's eye if i remember correctly was taken it was it was discovered and then used against odin unsuccessfully and then odin took it and kept it inside the uh, and kept it inside asgard that's the way things worked back then it's one of the reasons why if you go watch like the first thor movie or thor 2 you'll see that odin has like all these weapons gathered around his room those are weapons that he gained over the years by defeating various foes it's not things that just always existed in inside of uh inside of asgard but with regards to the arrival or i guess regards to the the temple itself and why it should be in korea the reason for this is is a uh, is twofold. The first is that because of the fact that Thor had raided the temple, the cannibals, the the servants of Sidorak, in turn call in their champion, who's a newly reformed Juggernaut. The other reason for this is because during the original Octessence, which is to say the various demons of other dimensions gathering together to see who was the strongest, the Crimson Gem, as it was created by Sidorak and left on Earth for some future person to find and become the Juggernaut, that happened in Korea. It didn't happen in Thailand. So it's kind of an interesting thing. Now we can largely assume that like different temples were made over the years. I mean, we can, we can sort of jump to that assumption, but the way it was originally done, the way it was covered in Eighth Day Juggernaut, is it was only ever just one temple of Sidorak. There weren't multiple temples. But when you have Juggernaut showing up here, we end up finding out that when Cain Marco went back to being the servant of Sidorak, that he's more powerful now than he's ever been before. Now, a lot of that was because when Cain Marco originally gained the uh, gained the, the Crimson Gem, that it was just a fraction of Sidorak's powers. And those powers, the, the potency would wax and wane over the years. Of course, the most, the most notable example, the strongest Juggernaut's ever been, was Tryon Juggernaut. But aside from that, this is basically him more in tune with Sidorak, being granted more power due to the fact that presumably Sidorak realized Juggernaut could leave at any point in time and simply didn't want him to. And so you end up having Thor, who's basically given a hammer by uh, by by one of the dwarves, uh, and then shows up and then goes to smash it on Juggernaut and it doesn't work. <laughs> the hammer goes to pieces. Remember, Mjolnir is, was thrown into the sun by Jane Foster. So as far as Jason Aaron's telling us, it's basically lost. Now it won't be. Thor will discover it eventually. I mean, it's the nature of comics. Everything that changes goes back to being the same again but this hammer doesn't work <laughs> <laughs> it just kind of fractures on, on Juggernaut. And so in turn, where Juggernaut starts to like pelt Thor, Thor in turn calls back out to uh, to the to the dwarves again and says, give me more hammers. And they just bring like thousands of hammers crashing down onto Earth. So it's literally Thor fighting Juggernaut with thousands of hammers. And we don't initially see it all happen. <laughs> in fact, we don't. We only see him pick up like one of the hammers and then use that hammer to like crush Juggernaut across the face. And then you just skip to the next scene, which is kind of disappointing because I would kind of want to see Thor fight Juggernaut with like a thousand hammers because because like when he when he gets there when he takes the the eye and he gets back to the dwarves he ends up telling him yeah i had to use them all like i had to use all the hammers and so they've all been destroyed i need more <laughs> 
<laughs> which is kind of funny, but it's a little bit sad because again, like I would kind of wanted to see that. I mean, I know you guys do. Nobody ever watches Thor to see him talk. People, people like they read Thor comics, like they want to see Thor like smash and stuff. It's like the Incredible Hulk. People are just like, yeah, I want to see the Incredible Hulk smash things. I know how you guys are because I'm the same way. I'm the exact same way. But uh, but the fact remains that we end up having him basically travel to visit directly with uh, with Odin. And when he's talking to Odin, Odin actually asks about her. And of course, this is Odin referring to Jane Foster. And this is a bit of a, a change for his character. And it's, and it's interesting because Jane Foster had earned the respect of Odin at the end of the story arc because when all the Asgardians failed and in the moment of testing, when Odin was basically faced with Mangog, the one being in the entire Marvel Universe that Odin is actually scared of, Jane Foster was the only one to stand up and rise to the challenge. And so she, basically she picked up the slack where Odin was weak and that really earned some, some brownie points. It earned some respect from Odin. And so that's when he asked the question, do you know where she is? Because Odin is actually concerned about Jane Foster, which is a total change because Odin was a reflection of, of a portion of the fan base who were just like, no, Jane Foster does not need to be Thor. She, he was written to kind of be that way, or at least that seems to have been the case. And so now he's just kind of like, yeah, like, like what happened to her? But then you end up having Thor transition back to Midgard and uh, in the Bronx, no less, <laughs> and meet up with uh, meet up with Jane Foster, only for us to find out that again, the War of Realms is still going on. So Malekith the Accursed, this warlord of the Dark Elves, is still like running across all the various realms and destroying everything that he can find and literally just like, like just laying siege to everything. I mean, just, just annihilating everything that he can find. That's really all he's doing. And so we end up finding out that, that like a lot of these refugees, these various elves and dwarves and so on and so forth, who have fled from their realms are being given safe passage in uh, in the Bronx. And not only that, Jane Foster is actually recovering from her cancer. So it's really basically Jason Aaron's way of saying she's not gone yet, which I'm very excited about. That makes me very, very happy. <laughs> I'm very pleased to see that. But it's really kind of the aftermath of Asgard's destruction. You have like, uh, like for example, Heimdall lost his eyes. So we can't see everything. I Meaning he could not see into the into the other realms and see how the realms are faring. The Bifrost Bridge is broken, so Thor can't go there. Asgard's basically cut off from everywhere except for Midgard. That, that's really the only place he can get to. And so we really have Jane Foster essentially tell Thor that the next weapon he's looking for is something called the Gem of Infinite Suns. And for the most part, it's exactly what it sounds like. It's a gem that houses the power of a thousand stars. The reason why it matters is if you go back and you read the old stories, the old Thor stories, there was a point where he was attacked with a casket of ancient winters, which creates like infinite cold, and the Gem of Infinite Suns counter that. It's basically the yin and the yang to the to the casket of ancient winners. It kind of exists, you know, as, as yin and yang to each other. But tracking that down again, it's just another weapon that was lost from, from Asgard, which Thor is trying to locate. Now, for the most part, it initially seems like busy work, right? It just kind of seems like, well, Thor is just kind of here doing things and tracking down weapons and so on and so forth. And it doesn't really seem like he serves a purpose. But this changes when Loki shows up here. When we basically find out that Thor has been taking all these weapons and like throwing them to a singular location and uh, well, really on a boat. And uh, which is kind of cool to see Thor like partying on a yacht. But still, Loki showing up here, I like the way that Jason Aaron does this because Thor is immediately hostile to him, right? Because he's like, hey, look, you stabbed Freya in the back at the beginning of this whole thing, the start of the War of Realms, and it was a poison dagger and Freya was unconscious and almost dead for quite some time. But again, the way that Jason Aaron has done this, he's been writing Loki in such a way to where it seems like there's actually something else going on. And Jason Aaron has been tight-lipped about it. Like, we have no idea. It's just there's something else happening here aside from Loki just turning against Freya and joining Malekith in the War of Realms. We don't know exactly what it is, but it, it seems like he's not entirely evil anymore. And so when he when he ends up basically telling Thor, he essentially tells him, look, you're going to have to go on a journey here. And this journey you're going to go on is going to locate one of the weapons you're looking for, but it's the weapon that will win the war. And so it's kind of cool because that entices Thor to a degree enough for him to kind of stop and then ask the question, what are we talking about? And Loki says, well, you have to go on a journey and find out and opens a portal and sends Thor off to another location. Now, the funny thing about this is Thor is just like, nope, I'm not going alone and grabs Loki and drags him in. <laughs> and Loki's just like, what are you doing, man? Like, like you're going to mess up the spell. <laughs> So it was kind of a funny moment between two brothers, and we end up finding out that where Loki has taken Thor to is the realm of Niflheim. Now, I want to have a little bit of a discussion here, and I want to talk about how the War of Realms is kind of what it really means here. So all in all, the War of Realms has only really been confined to a couple different places, or at least shown to us in a couple different places. It has been mentioned, of course, we've seen sort of off and on where it's expanded across the realms, but all in all, it's been dealing largely with like Jane Foster, how she's coping with it, so on and so forth, because she was the, the star of the Thor stories for some time. But the War of Realms, again, is kind of led by Malekith. And so what's going on here in Niflheim is that Niflheim actually houses a subsect of the realm that's called Helheim, which is essentially just the afterlife. Now, we've talked about this before in previous videos, so for those of you guys who have heard this, bear with me, but the realm of hell in, in Marvel Comics is not a place of, like, punishment, right? Like, it's not a place of, of torment. When it comes to those who follow the Norse mythological ideology but do not die in honorable battle, they go to Helheim. Those individuals who do die in honorable battle, they go to, to Valhalla. Now, that's just confined to those 
individuals on Earth in Marvel Comics who believe in like the, the Norse mythological deities and so on and so forth. Other religions travel to other afterworlds. And so again, it, it's really kind of spread out across the entire landscape of what could be the afterlife based on different realms and so on and so forth. But what's been going on here is the realm of hell is currently being ruled over by a guy named Baldur. Now, Baldur, of course, is the brother of Thor and he's long since been dead. And in true Norse mythology here in the real world, the death of Baldur signals the beginning of Ragnarok. In Marvel Comics, the death of Baldur is just the death of Baldur. It doesn't really mean anything. It was just kind of Jack Kirby back in the day following Norse mythology, but making taking a few liberties to kind of make it fit within the confines of, of Marvel Comics. But at the moment right now, there's a few things going on here. Now, for those of you guys who have read my or who have seen my video on Thanos or who have read the actual Thanos comic by Jeff Lemire, you essentially kind of know what's going on. Uh, but what had essentially happened, kind of winding the clock back a little bit, Marvel introduced a character named Angela. Now, Angela was a character, she was really from like the Spawn mythos. The issue was that the creator of, of Angela from the, the Spawn comics left uh, Image Comics and came to Marvel. And when he did, because Image is basically a, a creator owned company, whereby each creation that's made by a writer goes with them, they own it in its entirety, Angela ended up coming along with that particular, that particular creator. I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but she ended up coming with that creator. Marvel rolled her in and then didn't really know what to do with her. And so what they did is they wrote a story called Angela, Queen of Hell, where she basically invaded the realm of hell, invaded Niflheim, and then defeated Hela, cast her out of her own realm, and then took it over. And eventually, Baldur took the place of Angela, and then that's where things sort of stand right now. So at the moment, Hela is just kind of free-floating. She's just out there. Now, originally, she made a bargain with Thanos for the purpose of, re of using his power to re-secure her rule over hell, and we're just kind of in limbo waiting for that to happen, which will actually happen in this story. But at the moment, that's why Thor's brother is the one ruling over hell. Now, the other half of this is a character by the name of Cinder. Now, Cinder, of course, had previously appeared. We talked about her before, but for those, again, who are kind of catching up here, the idea behind Cinder is that she's essentially the daughter of Surtur. Now, Surtur had a lot of offspring, but the difference between Cinder and all the other offspring that he had was that when they were given a choice, Cinder chose the flame. She chose to follow her father's path, and so the result was that Surtur kept his daughter alive, and then when Surtur was killed by Odin, Cinder ascended as ruler of Muspelheim, and so she's the one who just kind of rules everything, and so Baldur is technically the ruler of hell, but not really, because he just doesn't have the power necessary in order to defeat Cinder. And so things are just sort of in pandemonium right now. Cinder's got her forces all over all over the realm of Niflheim, trying to find those who are usurpers who would try to take down her power. And so, of course, Loki and Thor being here presents a credible threat. And that's the reason why, right off the bat, the forces of Cinder start to arrive, and they have to basically face off against them and cast them out as best they can. Now, again, because of the fact that a lot of these different warriors here are in hell, what this means is that they've effectively died. Niflheim is basically a realm that's really home more to, like, the deceased or those who represent the deceased. These are individuals whose mythological story sort of goes hand in hand with what it means to be dead, even if they aren't technically dead. I mean, for the most part, they all are. But again, Surtur is effectively making a, you know, kind of making a pact with all of them, basically saying, look, I'm ruling this place. And while she's not really saying it in so many words, she's basically admitting that she's ruling by the skin of her teeth. And what she needs are the forces of all these other guys to go alongside her to one, make sure they won't try to challenge her rule, which is to say, band against her and overthrow her forces, which they could. And at, at, at the other, at the same time, because Cinder herself is essentially working alongside Malekith, who's leading the War of Realms, the alliance between Cinder and these forces in Niflheim would expand the forces of Malekith even further. So again, it's a massive campaign, and that's kind of what's being talked about here. And these discussions with, with Baldur, these discussions with Thor, with Tyr, who actually joins their ranks, again, another, another friend of Thor who's been dead for quite some time. Now, this is kind of a cool scenario, because when this whole thing happens, what you end up basically getting is, is the return of Hela, with Fenris, and, or I guess Fenrir, I think is how you pronounce it, Fenrir. I'm not 100% sure how to pronounce that name, but again, basically showing back up here and saying, look, like, I'm here to reclaim my realm. So again, it's kind of cool to see all this pop off, but everything sort of, of shuffling and, and being moved around and being bounced around. Now, again, it's, it's kind of interesting because for Hela herself, her ability to reclaim the realm, not necessarily guaranteed in the sense that Hela is powerful, especially inside her own realm. But just because she returns to the queen of hell doesn't mean that everybody would honor that, that return. Everybody would say, okay, we recognize you as a legitimate queen. And so what this means is that for Hela, she basically forms a marriage with Baldur in order to effectively secure the allegiance of those who are loyal to Baldur, as well as maintain those followers who are loyal to her. And so because of the fact that this alliance is, is basically being formed here, the forces of Hela and Baldur and Thor face off against the forces of Cinder, and for the most part, they hold their own. But what they need here is an additional source of power. What they need here are those individuals who are capable of fighting, because within the realm of Hell, these are like murderers and thieves and different things like that. And even if they were going to fight alongside Thor, which they're not, they're not really warriors, because if they were warriors, they would be in Valhalla. And so because of this, the issue that Thor faces is you cannot simply go to Valhalla, right? Like it's the one place you can't access. When Odin created Valhalla and established it as a place for the for those who died in honorable battle, the perspective of Odin was they did
did their time. They fought their fight. They don't need to fight anymore. And so they basically need to spend the afterlife in peace, enjoying their stories, telling their tales, getting drunk. That's it. And so it's basically a peaceful afterlife. Cutting it off from really the entirety of the universe where no one can access it is the only way to guarantee that. Now, again, we are talking about the power of Odin, which is not absolute. There are those out there who are more powerful than he is. And that's one of the cool things about Loki is that what Loki does is basically tell Thor, I can get you there. Like I can get you into Valhalla because one of the things to bear in mind when it comes to Loki's character is that as powerful as he is and as capable as he is, at the end of the day, he's not on the same level as Odin, but he does know a lot of these back channels for lack of a better word and using his magic to access places he's not really supposed to get to. So in effect, he can use his magic to create a kind of pocket back door, which will give Thor access to Valhalla proper. The issue is that when he gets there, because Odin and the Valkyrie and those who go to Valhalla are the only ones who are supposed to know where its existence is, when Thor arrives, you immediately have Brunhilde, the leader of the Valkyrie, who's like, you're not supposed to be here. Like, you're not dead. And because you're not dead, you cannot access Valhalla. And so she's basically the gatekeeper, the one who decides who can enter and who cannot. Now, at the same time this is happening, at the same time all this is going down, Baldur and even the forces of Cinder are kind of like, look, we're not really siding with Hela proper. And so because Hela really kind of turns her position and tries to kind of brute force her way in, what ends up happening is they're met with the arrival of Thanos. And this is kind of a funny thing, because what this is, is basically Jason Aaron's way of kind of removing Thanos from the equation and throwing him into Infinity Wars, because Infinity Wars was going on at the time the story was being written. And so the result is that where Infinity Wars was not really good, I would argue this is probably an editorial mandate. Then in reality, Thanos fighting against the forces of, of Niflheim, fighting in Hell alongside Hela, would actually be a sight to behold. And so because of the fact that she had previously struck a pact with him, what this does is it leads to Thanos turning against Hela and effectively walking away. And the reason why was because, again, Jason Aaron, presumably by editorial mandate, I don't really know what goes on behind the scenes, had to remove Thanos from the equation so Thanos could essentially be a part of, like, the Infinity Wars conflict. So, again, Again, kind of lame here, but Thanos basically leaves and basically walks away and says, hey, look, like my mistress calls and the Infinity Stones demand my attention. So just kind of like Mistress Death is back. I'm going to see her. I'll see you when I see you. Peace. Now, within the context of the story, it works because Thanos has always prized Mistress Death above everybody else. And even in the Thanos line of stories, he basically told Hela, you're no Mistress Death, but you'll do for right now. That's kind of the, the, the stance that he took. And so it made sense for what it was, but Thanos actually leaving and joining the realm of, of, the, of Hell and like facing off against all those forces would have been really, really really cool to see. And so again, with Thor basically speaking directly to Brunhilde and essentially saying, look, like, we need your forces because the realms are collapsing. We need all the honorable dead that are here in Valhalla. Ultimately, Brunhilde ends up agreeing here. Now, this is very big. And the reason why is because this is everyone who's ever fought, who's ever died in honorable battle in the name of the Asgardian mythos. Everyone who's ever died in honorable battle, presumably on Earth, possibly other places, who have believed in the Asgardian mythos are here. And so they're basically going to be joining with Thor and showing up to fight against the forces of Hela. And it's actually really, really, really cool to see. And it's pretty awesome to watch it all unfold because when this happens, the forces of Cinder are squashed in almost like the blink of an eye. They are readily crushed. Now, one thing to bear in mind here is that just because they're in the realm of Hell does not mean they cannot die again. Now, that's the question that's not answered here. What happens when they do? Originally, before Mistress Death was introduced, there was only the realm of Hell. And so the answer that Stanley and Jack Kirby gave back during the 60s and 70s was that when you die, if you die in honorable battle, you go to Valhalla. If you don't, you go to the realm of Hell, and that's it. When Mistress Death was introduced, then we actually got an afterlife for those who don't believe in the Asgardian mythos. The question that's not being answered here is, if you die either in the realm of Hell or in Valhalla, do you go to the realm of Mistress Death? Is that the one tried and true afterlife. That's not really the answer that we're given here. And so again, with Thor basically taking the power of Hela, like Thor becoming the ruler of Hell, basically using like this flaming battle axe, which looks absolutely amazing, and then crushing the entirety of the forces of Cinder, what this means is she basically retreats. In response to this, Baldur acquiesces, Hela returns back to being ruler of Hell, and for the most part, things kind of seem to be set the way they're supposed to be. And so what this means is that with the realm, the War of Realms effectively starting, that Hela is now back to being ruler of Hell. Things are as they were before. And it's just a matter of, of really asking the question, will the forces of Niflheim, will they join the forces of Thor alongside all the superheroes and presumably supervillains who exist in the Marvel Universe, as well as the warriors of Valhalla to face off against the forces of Malekith? That's really the question that's being asked here. And it's the question we do not have a definitive answer to. But with that being said, guys, we're going to bring this video to an end. If you are new here to Comics Explained, make sure you guys hit the sub button to become part of the Rob Corps. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure you drop a like and I will catch you all later. Peace.